the heavenly vision. Revelation 4 gives a glimpse of the heavenly throne room. This vision of the throne room is a powerful reminder of the majesty and glory of God. The presentation of the throne room, its description, the people surrounding it, and everything that happens shows that God is powerful like no other being. And yet, even though he is so far above us, he invites us into his presence. Have you ever sat and thought, why does a God so high and mighty care about little old me? Have you ever sat down and wondered at the holiness, glory and majesty of God Almighty? Have you ever stopped and thought about the day you finally see God high and lifted up on his throne? Have you ever stopped to think how moved and shocked and even unworthy you will feel to be in the presence of the Ancient of Days? In Revelation 4, we see a vision into heaven. Revelation 4 reveals to us a vision of things that you will one day see as a believer. I want you to just imagine, imagine the things that you will one day see. You will one day see God on his throne, to see him in all of his beauty and all of his glory. Can you imagine? You will one day see the living creatures described in the Bible. You will see the cherubim and seraphim. You will one day see the 24 elders seated on the 24 thrones. One day you will see the sea of glass that is as clear as crystal. You will one day see these things and we tend to think we are going to have to wait an extremely long time to see these things. But the truth is, we will not have to wait as long as you think. Let's say you have 80 more years to live on this earth, on the grand scheme of things. That is a very short amount of time in terms of eternity. So I can say that you will soon see these wonderful things written in Revelation 4, and how wondrous and glorious this will be. In Revelation 4 we see a vision into heaven. Revelation 4 contains several messages that can be broken down into different sections. Let us take a look at each of them. The Invitation into Heaven Revelation 4 verse 1 After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. The first thing we note from John's vision is the open door. There was an open door in heaven. John was called to go through the open door. John will be shown things that concern the future and not John's present day. This is why the book of Revelation is called The Unveiling. Its title is derived from the first word of the Koine Greek text, Apocalypsis, meaning unveiling or revelation of the things to come. Revelation 4 verse 2 and 3 Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Immediately I was in the Spirit. John was in the spirit and focus on what drew his attention. What drew his attention was the throne and the one who is sitting on the throne. Remember, 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 in the year that King Uzziah died and Isaiah saw the throne room of God, his attention was also drawn to the Lord and his throne. Isaiah 6 verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. 
and this is something that will be amazing. Heaven will have so many wondrous and glorious things, people and angelic beings. But all these things will fade into the background because of God and his wondrous and glorious throne. After all, the center of all things is his throne. All of creation bows before his throne. Within Revelation chapter 4, this word throne is used 14 times. And in the entire book of Revelation, the throne is mentioned over 45 times. John saw someone sitting on the throne, and the description of this person indicates that it was God. John likened the appearance of the person sitting on the throne to Jasper and Carnelian. Revelation 21 verse 11 describes Jasper as a stone that is as clear as crystal. It says, having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. This means that the one sitting on the throne was precious, blameless, holy and full of light. John also saw a rainbow surrounding the throne of God. Revelation 4 verse 3, And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. This rainbow was a complete rainbow, and not an arched rainbow like the rainbows we see here on earth. The rainbow symbolizes God's mercy and grace upon mankind. It shows that even in the last days, God will still show his mercy to the inhabitants of the world and will still call them to repentance. He is patient with us, and the best we can do is to turn to him. Genesis 9 verse 13 I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. This rainbow reminds us of the covenant God made with Noah, that he will never destroy the world again with a flood. The activities of praise and worship that take place in heaven are illustrated in Revelation 4 verse 4 to 11. The creatures around the throne represent different things. The 24 elders represent the redeemed people of God. Elders represent the people of God, especially in the Old Testament. The 24 courses of the priesthood represented all the priests, and we see this in 1 Chronicles 24. And the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles represent all the faithful. Revelation 4 verse 4 to 11, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. 
And when those beasts give glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth for ever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth for ever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy. O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The cherubim do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. The cherubim constantly repeat the phrase, Holy, holy, holy. This should reveal something to us about God. At his very core, God is holiness. God's holy nature and character is declared and emphasized with a three times repetition. It is indeed true that God is love, yet it is important to note that the cherubim do not rest day or night saying love, 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 but rather the cherubim do not rest day or night saying holy, holy, holy. And for endless ages in eternity, we too, like the cherubim, will marvel at the holiness of God. Unfortunately, in the generation we live in, there is a Christianity that is developing that ignores the holiness of God. And to be frank, it is a Christianity which is quite literally hostile towards the holiness of God. A Christianity that only believes that God is love. Therefore, because he is love, he accepts people living in sin and flaunting their sin and celebrating and condoning it. But that is not the God that sits on the throne in Revelation 4. The God who sits on the throne in Revelation is a holy God, who directs people to repent and believe, who directs his people to live holy lives. Allow me to focus on the last phrase in Revelation 4 verse 11. The elders worship God, saying, For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. This phrase affirms to truth that God is the great creator. Creation and all its wonders do not exist by accident. A creator God, out of his own will spoke everything into existence, including all the laws of nature. Think of a flower in the middle of the Amazon rainforest that no one has ever seen before. Why was it made? For God's pleasure. Think of the fish so deep under the sea that no human eye has laid upon them. Why were they created? For God's pleasure. The elders say they were created. For thy pleasure they are and were created. Even you yourself are created for his pleasure. Why don't you make every effort to please him? And the Bible tells us exactly how to do that. Hebrews 11 verse 6 But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse The four horsemen described in Revelation chapter 6 are beginning to somewhat show signs of their work. You only need to look at the last five years of the world and you can see signs of their arrival, signs of their effects upon the earth. The book of Revelations opens you up into the future. No other book comes under more scrutiny than the book of Revelation. No other book in the Bible is contested quite like the book of Revelation. And there are churches that actively avoid the book of Revelation. Churches that actively attempt to discredit the book of Revelation. That alone should tell you something about the book of Revelation. I believe the reason the book of Revelation is contested is because of two reasons. Reason number one being the book of Revelation reveals Jesus Christ 
in a way no other book in the Bible reveals Jesus Christ. It reveals him as he is today, not as a baby in a manger, but it reveals him as the living one. It reveals him as the Almighty. It reveals him as the one with the keys of death and Hades. The book of Revelation exalts the Son of the living God like no other book in the Bible. If you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ to a greater degree, go to the book of Revelation. The second reason is because it reveals the future and things to come. I believe wholeheartedly that the book of Revelation is unfolding before our eyes. We are living in just a preamble to the real event. What we are observing now is an introduction to what is yet to come. The vision of the four horsemen of the apocalypse is one of the most intriguing and prophetic visions from the Bible. John was given a vision of four horsemen that represented different aspects of the end times. These horsemen are often referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Revelation chapter 6 verse 1 Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. The opening of the seals represented different forms of judgment, and the first four involved horsemen who inflicted different disasters upon the earth. The first horseman, Revelation chapter 6 verse 2, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The fourth horseman was the rider on the white horse, and he is commonly known as the Antichrist or the false messiah. He comes to deceive people and lead them away from the one true God. This horseman represents the spirit of deception that will be rampant in the end times, as people will be led astray by him and the false prophet. In general, leading up to the Great Tribulation and even during it, there will be a tremendous amount of deception. Mark chapter 13 verses 5 through 6. And Jesus, answering them, began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. The Antichrist will come in a guise of righteousness and will deceive many with his lies. He will lead people away from the true God and towards himself. When we hear of the Antichrist, all we think of is the violence, the mark of the beast, the coercion. But what we need to know is that in the beginning of his rise, he will unite people of the earth before turning on them. Some have suggested that this rider is the quote, conquering Christ, because he rides a white horse and wears a crown. They suggest that he is the conquering Christ who is going around today, defeating the forces of evil in the world. In order to support this claim, they point to Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through 13 as proof. However, if we look at the surrounding context of the writer in white in Revelation chapter 6 and the writer in white in Revelation chapter 19, we can see clear differences. The Bible is clear. When Christ returns to the earth for his second coming, he does so at the end of the tribulation, not at the beginning. And when he does return, he presents a thousand years of peace and security known as the millennial reign. However, in stark contrast, the circumstances that follow the rider on this white horse in Revelation chapter 6 verse 2 is calamitous and cataclysmic. The first rider in white in Revelation chapter 6 is indeed the Antichrist, and it comes at no surprise to us the Antichrist resembles Jesus. After all, Satan produces counterfeits. The second horseman, Revelation chapter 6 verse 3 through 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. The second horseman is the rider on the red horse, who brings war and bloodshed upon the earth. We can already see the effects of this spirit in our world today, as wars and conflicts continue to rage on in various parts of the world. Nations have risen against other nations, families against other families, and individuals against individuals. 
War has been a part of the history of mankind since the very first murder between the two brothers in Genesis, and it will play a major role in the end times. Luke chapter 21 verses 9 through 10. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The third horseman, Revelation chapter six, verses five through six. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. The third horseman is the rider on the black horse who brings famine and economic collapse upon the earth. Within the Bible, the color black is associated with famine we see this in the following scriptures. Jeremiah chapter 14 verses 1 through 2. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth, Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. Immediately the third seal was opened, and John was directed to observe another horse, which was different from the former. The horse that John saw was a black horse, signifying famine, a terrible judgment of God, which will come upon the world in the last days and especially during the Great Tribulation. The one who sat on the horse had a pair of balances in his hand. The black horse represents famine and its rider had a pair of balances, suggesting that a time is coming when the people of the earth must eat their bread by measures, not out of being conservative, but for the sake of abject shortage of food. In other words, a man will have to work all day in order just to secure food for himself for just that one day. A great number of Bible scholars believe that Revelation chapter 6 verses 5 through 6 is referring to inflation. Inflation is the decline of purchasing power of a given currency over time. A quantitative estimate of the rate at which the decline in purchasing power occurs can be reflected in the increase of an average price level of a basket of selected goods and services in an economy over some period of time. The phrase, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny reflect the inflationary rise indicated in this Bible verse. The prices detailed in this verse are about 12 times higher than normal. This means that it would cost a day's wage to buy the ingredients for a loaf of bread. This describes a time of famine when life will be reduced to the barest necessities. The phrase, quote, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine, refers to the fact that less crucial supplies are available to those who can purchase them. In other words, the luxuries of life will be available for those who can purchase them. Matthew chapter 24 verses 12 through 13. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. The third horseman represents the fragility of our world and how easily our basic needs can be taken away. It is a reminder that hunger and poverty will strike the world amidst hard economic times. People often blame their government institutions, agencies, and leadership when hit by tough economic crisis. Many of them are not aware that it could be a sign that we are moving towards the fulfillment of prophecy. As Christians, we are called to be compassionate and generous towards those who are suffering from hunger and poverty. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves and to use our resources to help those in need. But this will be the opposite of what happens when the third seal is open. The third horseman will bring about hard times that no one will have anything to share out with another. The fourth horseman, Revelation chapter six, verse seven through eight. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. 
The fourth and final horseman is the rider on the pale horse who brings death and destruction upon the earth. Notice how John saw two personages on this horse. One was death and the other was Hades. And we see earlier in the book of Revelation who holds the key to both these things. It is no one other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. As we reflect on these four horsemen, we can see that they represent some of the most pressing issues that we face in our world today. Could it be that these horsemen are approaching? We must be prepared for the return of our Lord by living in a manner that honors God as we prepare for the coming of our Lord. The Four Angels at the Four Corners of the Earth Revelation chapter 7 is one of the parenthetical chapters in the book of Revelation. Parenthetical being the view of a subject without advancing the order of events. In simple terms, a parenthetical chapter is a pause in the sequence of events before they continue again. There is a clear pattern within the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation chronologically moves through the different events which express the wrath of God, which are the seven seals of God, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of God's wrath. Revelation chapter 7 is a parenthetical chapter placed in between the seven seals of God, between the sixth and the seventh seal. In Revelation chapter 6, the first six seals are open, which bring the likes of the four horsemen of the apocalypse onto the earth and other calamitous disasters unto the earth. And in the last verse, a question is asked, which opens the door for the topic of this parenthetical chapter we will examine today. Revelation chapter 6 verse 17. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation chapter 7 reveals to us who exactly shall be able to stand. Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 3. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Whilst reviewing this chapter, it is firstly important to highlight the two groups that will be saved. First of those are those protected Jews who are able to go through the great tribulation unharmed. We find them in Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 8. The second group is the great multitude of martyrs who are seen standing in heaven in Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 17. In Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 3, the holding the winds here is essentially the calm before the storm. We can see clearly that angels are associated with forces of nature. For instance, in Revelation chapter 7 verse 1, which I just read, they are associated with the wind. In Revelation chapter 14 verse 18, they are associated with fire. And in Revelation chapter 16 verse 5, they are associated with water. Some Bible scholars hold the view that this holding of the winds is literal, whilst others hold the view that this holding of the winds is figurative, as winds are emblems of commotions, and very properly, as they are the natural causes of storms. Thus, this figurative expression is used and explained by Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 36 and 37. And upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and will scatter them towards all those winds, and there shall be no nation whither the outcasts of Elam shall not come. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before them that seek their life, and I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. 
Whether this holding of the winds is literal or figurative is not what is pivotal. What we should dwell on is this, that in this chapter, there is clearly a pause in the chronological wrath of God occurring on the earth at that time. And this pause is caused by four separate angels standing at the four corners of the world. What is interesting is that a fifth angel arrives onto the scene and tells us exactly why this calm in the storm is taking place. And that is because the earth and the seas should not be harmed until the servants of our God have been sealed with the seal of God on their foreheads. Within scriptures, a seal indicates ownership and protection. What may surprise you is that you too, if you are a believer in Christ, are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 through 14, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The seal of the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that first of all, you belong to him. Yes, you do. And secondly, that you will spend all of eternity with him in heaven. However, the seal we see here in Revelation chapter 7 is one of protection that is given specifically to the 144,000, meaning they will be able to get through the great tribulation safely. This seal is in stark contrast to the mark of the beast the Antichrist will give to those who worship and follow him. The four angels at the four corners of the earth indicate that God's power and authority extend to all parts of the world. The earth has four corners, the east, the west, the north, and the south. Each corner has one angel, holding the wind from blowing against the earth. Winds, as illustrated in various texts in the Bible, were used by God for different purposes. One of the ways God used the wind was to cause destruction upon the land to punish his people. It was a destructive force of God's judgment on the sinful inhabitants of the earth. Exodus chapter 10 verses 13 through 14 says, So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. The wind that blew from the east brought about locusts in Egypt during the time that Moses had been sent to rescue the Israelites from the cruel hands of the Egyptians. The winds brought about a calamity and a plague on the Egyptians. Ezekiel chapter 13 verse 13. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will cause a stormy wind to break forth in my fury, and there shall be a flooding rain in my anger, and great hailstones in fury to consume it. Jonah chapter 1 verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. He sent a wind on the sea to disrupt Jonah's journey. The wind shook the ship that Jonah was using to run away from God. The angels exercised authority to hold back winds from destroying the land as they waited for God's instruction to release it. By holding back these winds, the angels were protecting the earth from their devastating effects. And God gave out his instructions through an angel that descended from the east. This is why the four angels had to wait. They could not unleash the winds of destruction until God's faithful servants had been sealed and protected. A similar thing happened in the land of Egypt when God sent the plague on the firstborn of the Egyptians. He told Moses to have the Israelites' doorposts marked so that they would not be affected by the plague. Exodus chapter 12 verses 12 through 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. 
The seal of God will protect the 144,000 from the effect of the four angels that will blow their trumpets in Revelation chapter 8, and also from the remaining three angels that will blow their trumpets that are known as the three woes. So, what can we learn from this as believers? One, God is in control. Two, God protects and claims those who are His. Mankind and human beings have this misconception that they are in control. The truth is that we are not in control. Really and truly, we are not in control. The governments in your country are not in control. The wealthiest people in the world are not in control. Kingdoms have risen and kingdoms have fallen. The Mongol Empire, which was founded by the Mongol warlord Temujin, who assumed the title of Genghis Khan, rose, and yet his empire still fell. The Roman Empire rose, and yet it still fell. Look at the corridors of history, and you will see a pattern of kingdoms rising and kingdoms falling. All the while, God is still in control. He alone is in charge of all the universe. Lightning does not strike without His permission. Thunder does not roar without His go-ahead. Winds and waves obey Him. He alone is in control. 2. God protects and claims those who are His. Isn't that wonderful to know this Almighty God, who is in control, actively claims and protects those who are His? God claims those who are His, and those who belong to God will spend all eternity with Him. the 144,000 from the tribe of Israel, who they are and what they do. One of the most intriguing passages in the book of Revelation is the description of the 144,000 sealed servants of God in Revelation 7 verse 1 to 8. Who are these people and what is their significance? The book of Revelation is a book of prophecy that describes the end of the world and the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. In this context, the 144,000 represent a special group of people who are sealed by God and protected from the trials and tribulations of the end times. Revelation 7 verse 1 to 4 after these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. The angel says, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. There are a lot of controversies surrounding the 144,000 redeemed souls that John wrote about in the book of Revelation. Some people believe they are the total number of people that will be saved in the entire universe. But this view cannot be true, because God desires that all should be saved. Salvation is not for any group of people specifically. Salvation is not for a particular race or people. Salvation is not for a specific socio-economic background. Jesus Christ died for all mankind. He died for all nationalities. He died for the rich and the poor. He died for Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, Oceania, and Antarctica. He died for the young and the old. We know from scriptures that Christ died for all sinners. God has an open invitation to all men and all women. 
Salvation is not for only the 144,000. There are even churches that have risen over the years that have claimed that their church members are the 144,000 spoken of in the book of Revelation. They would recruit members by imposing the idea that if you join their church, you will be part of the 144,000. Other churches turned this into a money-making scheme. They would call requesting people to pledge money or tithe to their church, stating that you too can be a part of the 144,000. There are many different groups in the world today and in the past who attempt to say that they are the inner circle of the 144,000. So who are then? The 144,000 John wrote about. The 144,000 are said to be chosen from the 12 tribes of Israel. Revelation 7 verse 5 to 8. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of God, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. You see, the identity of the 144,000 is clearly stated in the Bible. God did not leave any grey areas as to the identity of this select group of people. They are of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now something that may stand out to you in this list of tribes is that Manasseh is listed here, but he is actually the son of Joseph. Let me explain. If you remember in Genesis 48, Jacob went down to Joseph in Egypt after Jacob had thought for decades that his son was dead. To meet his father, Joseph took two of his own sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Remember, Manasseh is one of the tribes listed in Revelation 7. So, Jacob said to his son Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim are mine. He claimed these two sons. As a result, Manasseh and Ephraim became tribes in Egypt. And as Jacob was about to bless these two sons who he had now claimed, Joseph positioned them intentionally so the older could receive the right hand blessing, according to custom. Jacob deliberately crossed his hands and put his right hand on Ephraim's head and his left hand on Manasseh's head. This is such an interesting topic for another day, why he chose to bless Ephraim his right hand. Now on the list of 12 tribes, Manasseh is mentioned, but Ephraim is not. That is because in the list, Joseph is representing Ephraim in that list. The descendants of this tribe are here on earth. Depending on how close we are to the Great Tribulation, the actual 144,000 themselves could all be here on the earth right now, for all we know. But one thing we do know for sure is that they are here and on earth. Whether it may be their fathers and mothers, or their grandparents, or great-grandparents, we know that the lines of these tribes are where 144,000 will come. John describes who the 144,000 were and the criteria that was used in singling them out from all the people. Revelation 14 verse 1 to 5 says, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, 
standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I hear was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. The mark on their foreheads was also revealed. It was the name of God and of the Lamb that was written on their foreheads. The seal revealed that they belonged to God and no one should harm them. The 144,000 from tribes of Israel will be a light to the thick darkness of the world during the Great Tribulation. They will stand for the truth and defend the name of the Lord. Revelation 14 verse 4 and 5 tells us their attributes. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. They will portray the holiness of God in a world laden with sinful abominations. They will preach the gospel of Christ in the midst of the Antichrist's hostility without fear of persecution. This proves that no matter how perverse a generation is, God will always have a remnant who will stand for him. God will always have his preachers. We do not need to be confused about whether it is only the 144,000 that will make heaven because the Bible does not say so. Revelation 7 verse 9 and 10 further records that there are other multitudes of saints just immediately after mentioning the 144,000. It says, After this I behold, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. The 144,000 will lead the entire saints and the host of heaven in a new song to the Lord. So when we get to heaven, all we will do is to sing the praise of the Most High from everlasting to everlasting. The Great Multitude From the very inception of God's plan of salvation, His intentions have always been global in scope. Throughout the Bible, we witness a divine narrative that unveils a strategy that extends beyond any particular nation or group of people. It is impossible to engage with the scriptures without recognizing the overarching theme of God's desire for the redemption and reconciliation of the entire world. From the early chapters of Genesis, we encounter God's promise to Abraham that through his descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. This covenant or promise reflects God's intention to extend his grace and salvation to all people, transcending cultural, ethnic, and geographic boundaries. The Hebrew prophets consistently spoke of a day when people from every nation would come to worship the one true God. 
These prophetic glimpses anticipate the grand vision depicted in Revelation 7 verse 9, where a multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue stand before the throne, united in worship. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, we see his interactions with individuals from various backgrounds, including Gentiles, Samaritans, and those considered outsiders by the religious establishment of the time. Jesus' commission to his disciples before his ascension was to go and make disciples of all nations. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost empowered the disciples to proclaim the gospel in multiple languages, an indication of the global scope of their mission. The early Christian community recognized the universal nature of the gospel message and its call to reach all people. The Apostle Paul, in his missionary journeys, traveled extensively to proclaim the good news to both Jews and Gentiles, planting churches in diverse regions such as Asia, Minor, Greece, and Rome. Paul's letters also contain exhortations for unity and reconciliation among believers from different cultural backgrounds emphasizing the global vision of God's redemptive plan. Revelation 7 speaks of a great multitude standing before the throne of God, clothed in white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. Who are these people? What is their significance and what can we learn from their example? First, it's important to note that this group is distinct from the 144,000 mentioned earlier in the chapter. While the 144,000 are described as being sealed from among the tribes of Israel, this great multitude is said to come from every nation, tribe, people and language. This diversity is evidence that the gospel message is not limited to a particular group of people, but is intended for all mankind. As Jesus himself promised in Matthew 24 verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The gospel of Christ will be preached to people from every nation, tribe and language before the end of the world. Revelation 7 verse 9 and 10 After this I beheld, and, lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. These individuals are described as having come out of the Great Tribulation because they would not worship the world ruler or take his mark during the Great Tribulation. There is no confusion as to who exactly this great multitude is, because an elder tells John they are in Revelation 7 verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, they are the Gentiles saved through faith in Jesus Christ during the great tribulation. Scripture leaves no room for doubt. These are the ones saved through faith in Jesus Christ during the Great Tribulation. This will be a tremendous feat, because to confess Christ during the Great Tribulation will come at a tremendous cost to the people on the earth at the time. And the truth for most of us in the world right now is that we can confess Christ and still buy and sell. 
We can confess Christ and still earn a living, have jobs, own homes. However, during the Great Tribulation, this will not be possible. There will be a persecution directed to anyone who confesses Christ. As a young believer in Christ, I thought I understood what persecution was until I read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And after reading that book, I received just a glimpse of what true persecution is and was. I encourage you to read Fox's Book of Martyrs so you may see just a glimpse of what true persecution is. Revelation 7 draws a possible correlation between the vast multitude from diverse nations, tribes and languages, and the 144,000 sealed servants of God. While the 144,000 are specifically identified as coming from the 12 tribes of Israel, the multitude represents individuals from every tribe and nation. John's vision reveals the presence of the 144,000 on earth and the countless multitude in heaven. It can be inferred that the mission of the 144,000 involves evangelizing the world following the rapture and proclaiming the gospel during the tribulation period. Through their ministry, a significant outcome emerges. Multitudes of people from various nations, tribes, peoples and languages come to embrace faith in Jesus Christ. Furthermore, we are reminded that heaven is a place of great diversity. John notes that the multitude comes from every nation, tribe, people and language, and we can assume that this diversity extends beyond their earthly origins. In heaven, we can expect to encounter a rich tapestry of cultures, languages and traditions reflecting the beauty and creativity of God's creation. Just as there are differences among people on earth, so too will there be differences among the saints in heaven. We will not be all the same, but we will be individuals with our own unique identities. The inclusive nature of God's redemptive plan is emphasized throughout the scriptures. The message of salvation through Jesus Christ is not limited to a particular group or ethnicity, but extends to all of humanity. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 3 verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This verse highlights the equality and unity that is found in Christ, transcending the barriers that divide us. The work of Christ on the cross is universal in its scope. He offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, breaking down the walls of division and offering reconciliation to every person regardless of their ethnic background or social status. In Revelation 5 verse 9, the redeemed sing a new song to the Lamb, proclaiming, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. God has faithful worshippers scattered across the world. We must not underestimate the presence of true believers in every corner of the globe. Even in the most remote and secluded regions, you will find followers and lovers of Christ. They may not look like us or speak the same language, but they share a common devotion to the Lord and a deep love for the one true God. Before I had the opportunity to travel to different continents, I lived in a limited bubble of experience. It wasn't until I embarked on my journeys and encountered people from diverse cultures and backgrounds that my perspective expanded. 
I witnessed firsthand the vibrant faith and worship of those who may appear different from me outwardly, but share the same love and devotion to God. Heaven will not be an empty place. It will be filled with a multitude of believers from every nation, tribe, people and tongue. Revelation 7 verse 9 provides a glimpse of this reality, assuring us that the heavenly realm will be teeming with the redeemed from every corner of the earth. The true church is a global and diverse community, comprising people from various cultural, ethnic and linguistic backgrounds. This truth challenges us to break free from our limited mindset and embrace the richness of God's diverse creation. We are called to recognize that our understanding of God and our worship is not confined to a single culture or language. The global body of Christ testifies to the boundless beauty and creativity of our Creator, who receives worship in countless forms and expressions. This truth calls us to embrace the diversity of God's creation and to celebrate the richness of different cultures and languages. It reminds us that our unity in Christ does not erase our unique identities, but enhances them. In heaven, we will have the privilege of worshipping God together with people from every corner of the earth learning from one another's experiences and discovering the beauty of God's creation through the lens of different cultures. As we anticipate the fulfillment of this vision, we are called to pursue unity and love in our present lives. We are to extend hospitality and respect to those from different backgrounds, seeking to understand and appreciate their unique perspectives. Through our love and unity, we become a testimony to the transformative power of the Gospel, which unites people from diverse backgrounds into one family. Revelation 7 verse 11 to 13 And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? The Silence in Heaven Heaven is a busy place. There is no place in all of the universe as busy as heaven. And we see the busyness of heaven the most in the book of Revelation, in chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, and in chapter 7. In these chapters, we see the children of God are all gathered around the throne, and they are praising and worshiping the Lamb of God, and glorifying and uplifting God Almighty. Amidst all of this praise and worship and exaltation of the Lord, there is a sudden and dramatic halt in heaven. Everything stops. Absolutely everything stops. And there is complete and utter silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. The silence in heaven that happened after the opening of the seventh seal is something that is puzzling. Revelation 8, 1 When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Heaven is known to be a place of constant praise and worship to God. Revelation 4, 8 through to 11. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, Whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. 
for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Heaven is typically depicted as a place of constant praise and worship. However, in this moment, all activity in heaven comes to a halt. The heavenly hosts stop singing, the angels cease their work, and a profound stillness descends upon all of heaven. A half-hour silence is not long on the grand scheme of things, but because of the setting and context, a half-hour is a long time when it is in a place as busy and loud as heaven. Since heaven is a place of constant praise and worship to God, silence for about half an hour is a long time. The scripture makes it clear that the four living creatures did not rest day or night. They spent every minute offering praises to God, worshiping Him, giving thanks to Him, and glorifying Him. The 24 elders bowed in awe and reverence as they worshiped the Almighty God. Every minute in heaven was a minute of praise to the King who sits on the throne. But why would there be a moment of silence in heaven? Even though the Bible doesn't openly tell us what the silence meant, it is natural to ask ourselves what this silence means and what it represents. And as we dig deeper into this, we can discover a profound spiritual truth that can inspire us in our daily lives as believers. In the verse preceding the silence, there were events that led up to this moment. This was the breaking of the sixth seals, which brought about catastrophic events on earth. There was the four horsemen. There was war, famine, and death. Every seal was accompanied by a judgment upon mankind. But when the seventh seal is opened, there is a sudden and dramatic pause in the narrative, a silence that lasts for half an hour. The silence in heaven represented the weight of the moment. Words cannot describe the sheer and utter stunning silence that will be there. Can you imagine the face of those in heaven in complete silence? Millions and millions of saints completely silent. An unnumerable number of angels in complete silence. Moses, Enoch, Elijah, all in stunned silence. Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John, all in silence. Can you imagine the atmosphere during these 30 minutes? Nowhere in Scripture do we see anything like this moment. The seven seals and the seven trumpets represent God's judgment upon the world, and the consequences of this judgment are dire. The disasters unleashed upon the world through the sounding of the trumpets were intended to be warnings, but they were also a harsh reality check for humanity. The silence in heaven may have represented the solemnity of this moment, the realization that the judgment of God is imminent, and that the time for repentance is running out. In Revelation 8 2, King James Version, we will see what was about to happen and what made the host of heaven silent. It says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, Seven angels were given seven trumpets which they are to blow. Seven different things will happen at the sound of these trumpets. What are these things? What on earth would silence all of the archangels? What will silence every cherubim and seraphim? What will silence all of the redeemed saints? I understand why the seven trumpets will silence the saints that are in heaven at this time because the saints have never seen the judgment of God like this before. But what I struggle to understand is how these events will even silence the angels. The angels! The reason I say this is because the angels have witnessed every calamity that has ever taken place. Every natural disaster to ever happen on the earth, the angels have witnessed. Every earthquake, every hurricane, every tornado, they have seen it all. Every one of God's judgments that has ever happened on earth, they have witnessed. The angels saw the judgment of Adam and Eve when they were driven out of the garden with flaming swords. The angels saw the judgment of Noah's generation with the flood and how the mighty men ran for the hills and failed. The angels witnessed the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah and every earthquake, every hurricane, 
Every tornado, every volcanic eruption, they have seen it all. Yet here in the book of Revelation, there is complete and utter silence. They are all standing in stunned silence, looking down on the earth. So what is it that stunned all of heaven into silence? I will tell you what it is. Never in the history of all mankind has God unleashed all of His fury at one time, and now He's about to. And all of the inhabitants of heaven see the wrath of God building and building and building, as God waits for 30 minutes before He releases it. The opening of the seventh seal was a prelude to the trumpets that were to sound, heralding the final judgments of God upon the earth. The silence was a moment of waiting and watching, as the angels and saints in heaven prepare for the events to come. The angels stood in silence before God, waiting for instructions from Him. The imagery in this chapter is intense, and it is easy to be consumed by the symbolism. The silence was followed by the seven angels being given seven trumpets to sound. But before they sounded, Another angel offered incense and prayers to God. The angel that hurled the golden censer filled with fire on the earth that resulted to rumblings and earthquakes. The thunder, lightning, and the earthquake alerted the seven angels that it was time to sound their trumpets. As each trumpet sounded, a different disaster was unleashed upon the earth. The first trumpet brought hail and fire mixed with blood which represented the destruction of the earth's vegetation and natural resources. The second trumpet brought a great mountain burning with fire that is thrown into the sea, causing the destruction of a third of the sea creatures. The third trumpet brought a star called Wormwood that fell from heaven and poisoned a third of the earth's fresh water sources. The fourth trumpet brought darkness to a third of the earth. The purpose of these warnings was to call mankind to repentance. The disasters described in this chapter are not random acts of violence, but rather a part of God's plan for redemption in the last hour. Even in these final hours, God is interested in the hearts of men turning towards Him in repentance. The first four trumpets reveal the true extent of the mercy of God's judgment. These are partial judgments, striking only one-third and are meant to warn and lead a rebellious world to repentance before the final curtain. Revelation 8, 6 through 13. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and night likewise, and I beheld, and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels. With all of this that happens to the earth, no wonder, no wonder all of heaven was silent. The book of Revelation is like no other book. A wise preacher once said there are two books that the devil hates most. Firstly, it is the book of Genesis because it reveals to us the true nature of the devil. 
and the second book is the book of Revelation because it reveals to us where the devil is going, and that is the lake of fire. The book of Revelation shows us where the world is heading. As you read the book of Revelation, you can see that the things that were written in this book 2,000 years ago are slowly but surely coming together and falling into place. The ninth chapter of the book of Revelation shows us a remarkable view into the spirit world. In this chapter, we see the spirit world spilling over into our world. The ninth chapter is probably one of the most controversial chapters in the Bible. The late Wilbur M. Smith, who made the book of Revelation his special study once wrote, It is probable that, apart from the exact identification of Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18, the meaning of the two judgments in this chapter represents the most difficult major problem in Revelation. This chapter reveals to us the reader's two frightening armies that cause havoc, the army from the pit and the army from the east. But today we are going to focus on the army from the pit, the bottomless pit. A great deal of controversy among biblical scholars surrounds Revelation 9, 1 through 12. Some scholars argue that this is a description of literal locusts that come out of the bottomless pit. Others argue that what comes out of the pit are the decomposing souls of the unsaved. Other scholars argue that this is a description of fighter helicopters that John saw, and because of his time, the only thing he could relate it to was locusts. Others believe that it is an army of demons that will come out of the pit that can only be described as locusts. Let us read Revelation 9, 1 through 12. Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings on their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. One one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. In the book of Revelation, Apollyon is introduced in chapter 9, verse 11. His name is derived from the Greek word Apollyon, meaning destroyer. This serves as a powerful descriptor of his nature, highlighting his role as an agent of destruction and chaos. You do not receive the name quote, the destroyer, by chance or accident. He is a real being that will bring destruction at his wake. Can you imagine the devastation that will come along with him? While some equate Apollyon with Satan, careful examination reveals that they are distinct entities. Satan is referenced later in Revelation, specifically in chapter 20, when he is bound for 1,000 years. Satan is not Apollyon, and Apollyon is not Satan. The Bible in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 mentions various scriptural forces such as rulers, authorities, and powers. Apollyon can be understood as one of these entities. These references illuminate the existence of a spiritual hierarchy of evil 
with Satan at its head, and Apollyon serving as one of his underlings. The distinction between these entities highlights the multifaceted nature of spiritual warfare, reminding us of the different levels and manifestations of darkness. There are levels to Satan's kingdom. John, the man who was shown what will happen in the end time on the island called Patmos, saw something spectacular. He saw that the things that come out of the bottomless pit have a leader, a king that rules over them, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollon. This story did not start here. We must have been hearing about this name called Apollon. There have been short movies and videos that have been made and titled Apollon. We must have also heard of Apollon the Destroyer before. We may know of this name, but many of us don't know who or what bears this name. We don't know the power of the entity bearing this name, and we don't have the idea of what the entity will do. Many people have believed that this particular being that John talked about was Satan himself. They believed it is another name for Satan because of the title that was given to this angel, the Destroyer. But Apollon cannot be Satan, and I will explain why. Starting from what led to this part of the Bible, John was seeing trumpets sounded by angels and things were happening. As the trumpet sounded, each trumpet presents a disaster worse than the disaster that preceded it. The fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are called the three woes. The fifth trumpet was sounded by the fifth angel and something happened. Revelation 9.1 And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. John said a star fell from heaven. This same star was given a key to the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is a place that can only be described as a place of detention for the wicked angels, or the demon's world. If we remember another thing John said about this bottomless pit, it is a place where Satan himself would be locked for a thousand years. We see this in Revelation 23. Here, this pit in Revelation 9, the pit is locked, but someone was given a key to open the bottomless pit. John said a star fell from heaven, and it was given the key to the bottomless pit. We were made to know that this star was a being, and the word he. The use of the word he is used to indicate that it was a being. The exact identity of this being who is given the keys is not known. Some argue it is Satan himself who is given the key, and others argue that it is an angel. The exact identity of this star is not explicitly stated. After the star was given the key, what did he do? The Bible says that he opened the bottomless pit. After he opened it, some locusts that looked like scorpions came out of the pit. The leader of these things was described in Revelation 9:11, whose name is Abaddon in Hebrew, and then Apollon in Greek, meaning the destroyer. The first thing we can know about this Apollon being is that he is locked up in the bottomless pit waiting to be freed. These things all came from a place called the bottomless pit. This should make us know one of the things that are in this place called the bottomless pit. It houses demons, angels of Satan, and all kinds of spirits that these angels control. There must be more angels like Apollon in this pit, but what we are concerned about is the Apollon who is given the power to destroy the earth. The fact that the Bible used the word locust doesn't mean they were ordinary locusts. If we look at the descriptions of these locusts, they look nothing like locusts. Revelation 9, 7-10, KJV. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions and they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings were as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. These things don't look like locusts. If we know what locusts are, they're like grasshoppers. They have hind legs, which they can use to jump sometimes. They don't have human heads or human hair. They don't have breastplates. They don't have the shape of horses, and they look nothing like horses. That should tell you the description that John gave about these locusts doesn't mean that they look like the actual locusts, but the Bible scholars believe that he called them locusts because of their mission and their number. What do locusts do? The simple answer is, they destroy plants. Except these won't be destroying plants, 
and typically if you see a locust, you can't number them. They come in their thousands, hundreds of thousands. We see in the Bible that Satan fell with a third of the angels. Therefore, we know that the devil does have beings that work under him. The kingdom of Satan does have a hierarchy. That are some spirits that are evil and more wicked than others. Just like we have the archangels in heaven who lead the other angels in some specific assignments, like fighting battles and delivering the messages of God to human beings, we can see the angel Michael in the book of Daniel helping the angel that was held by the prince of Persia. We can also get the record of his war with the fallen angels and Satan in heaven. Revelation 12, 7 through 8, KJV. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Angel Michael leads battles, and Apollon on the other side of Satan leads a group of demons or evil spirits that are described as locusts. It doesn't matter how powerful this angel is. It doesn't matter the number of things he can destroy. It doesn't matter the number of armies he has. His powers are limited. No matter how powerful and strong Apollon is, no matter how big his army is, he is not almighty. Only the Lord is almighty. However, the power Apollon will have during this period of time while he is on earth isn't to be played with. Revelation chapter 9 verses 13 through 15. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels, who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year, were released to kill a third of mankind. Today we will focus on the second woe in the book of Revelation which is the release of the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. The release of the four angels at the great river Euphrates marks a turning point in the book of Revelation. The first four trumpets were a warning, a call to repentance, and an invitation to turn to God. But the fifth and sixth trumpets are more severe, and their judgments are directed specifically against those who refuse to repent. In the first woe, mankind is not killed but rather tormented by demonic locusts and their leader, Apollyon the Destroyer. No one dies during this time. However, during the second woe, a powerful army is unleashed to kill a third of mankind. According to the scripture, when the sixth trumpet sounds, four angels who had been bound at the great river Euphrates are released. These angels were specifically prepared for this significant event. Although we do not know who prepared them, they were bound for this particular hour and for a divine purpose. While it is uncertain whether these angels are considered bad, it is likely that they are evil angels. I personally believe they are evil angels because no holy angel would be bound. Nevertheless, regardless of their nature, they serve the divine purpose. The reason these angels were bound specifically at the river Euphrates and not any other river is not explicitly stated in the scripture. However, the Euphrates River holds significant symbolism throughout the Bible. It is associated with several significant events and places. In Genesis chapter 2 verses 10 through 14, it is linked to the first sin and the location of the Garden of Eden. Additionally, the Euphrates River holds significance as a landmark of Babylon. Babylon represents human pride, rebellion, and idolatry. It was the first great empire that persecuted God's people. The river also served as a crucial military asset, providing protection to the city of Babylon from invasion. While the exact reason for binding the angels at the Euphrates is not explicitly explained, these associations highlight the historical and symbolic importance of the river in relation to rebellion, sin, and the opposition faced by God's people throughout biblical history. Revelation chapter 9, verses 16 through 19. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. 
and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. By the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. The description of the horsemen in Revelation chapter 9, verses 16 through 19, is indeed strange and grotesque, presenting a vivid image of horror, destruction, and a connection to the demonic realm. Some have suggested that if these horsemen represent a natural army of men, the peculiar description could be symbolic of modern warfare with its mechanized equipment and advanced weaponry. It is possible that John, in his limited understanding, used these vivid terms to depict the technology of his time. However, upon careful examination, it becomes clear that the description does not align with conventional war horses or modern military equipment like fighter jets or tanks. The imagery goes beyond what can be attributed to human technology. Therefore, a safer interpretation may be to understand this as a literal army of 200 million, but not composed of human beings from a specific nation. Instead, it signifies a demonic army invading the earth, held in bondage by the Lord until the appointed time when God grants them permission to unleash their destructive power. This interpretation aligns with the earlier description of the demonic locusts in the same chapter. The idea of a demonic army fits within the overall context of Revelation and the spiritual warfare depicted throughout the book. It emphasizes the forces of evil being unleashed upon the world during the end times, working in accordance with God's divine plan. Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 through 21. But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. It is indeed surprising that despite witnessing the remarkable events described in the book of Revelation, including the sounding of seven trumpets, catastrophic natural disasters, the torment of demonic locusts, and the rise of Apollyon the destroyer, the people on earth remain unrepentant. One would expect that such extraordinary occurrences would lead them to recognize the gravity of their actions and turn to God. Consider the sounding of seven trumpets. Each trumpet brought forth a different judgment or catastrophe upon the earth, serving as a clear sign of divine intervention. These calamities, such as hail mixed with blood, a burning mountain cast into the sea, and darkened skies, should have prompted a deep reflection on their sinful ways. But men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil, and they refused to repent. Furthermore, the torment caused by the demonic locusts with Apollyon leading their destructive charge should have shaken their hearts and caused them to seek mercy and forgiveness. The very presence of such demonic forces should have served as a wake-up call, exposing the darkness of their deeds and the need for repentance. But men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, and they refused to repent. Yet despite all these astonishing events and divine judgments, the people stubbornly persist in their sinful ways. It reveals the depth of their spiritual condition and the hardness of their hearts. Even when faced with God's righteous judgment, they remain unyielding, clinging to their sinful lifestyles. In the book of Revelation, there is a striking depiction of people who would rather seek death than repent. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, it is written that they recognize the judgment of God unfolding before their eyes. They were aware of the magnitude of His power and authority, to the point that they longed for mountains to fall on them, seeking escape from the impending judgment. This portrayal reveals the depth of their hardness of heart and stubborn rebellion. Despite witnessing the undeniable truth of God's existence and His righteous judgment, they chose to resist repentance. It highlights the tragic reality of individuals who, in the face of God's mercy, 
and call for transformation obstinately cling to their sinful ways, unwilling to turn from their wickedness. It serves as a reminder of the importance of a softened heart and a willingness to humbly submit to God, acknowledging our need for His forgiveness and salvation. This stubbornness demonstrates the fallen state of humanity. It shows how deeply ingrained sin can be, blinding individuals to the reality of their need for salvation and preventing them from embracing God's mercy. It is a tragic reflection of the human tendency to resist divine grace even in the face of overwhelming evidence. However, it is crucial to remember that God's ultimate desire is for all people to come to repentance and experience His redeeming love. The events unfolding in Revelation serve as warnings and opportunities for individuals to turn away from their sin and embrace God's forgiveness. Though the people's response may be disheartening, it underscores the importance of persistently sharing the message of salvation and interceding for those who are still lost in their unrepentant ways. In Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 through 21, we witness a sobering truth. People will be worshiping demons. It is a thought that may seem difficult to grasp, but if we honestly reflect on the state of our world today, we can see glimpses of this reality already unfolding. In our present society, it is becoming increasingly common for Satan and his influences to be celebrated and embraced. The deceptions and lies spread by the enemy are subtly creeping into various aspects of our lives, often masked as normal or even progressive ideologies. The values and principles rooted in God's truth are being challenged and replaced with a distorted moral compass. The media, entertainment industry, and popular culture often glorify behaviors and beliefs that directly contradict God's teaching. What was once considered immoral or sinful is now celebrated and applauded. Satan is paraded around, sometimes under the guise of freedom or personal expression, encouraging people to indulge in activities that are contrary to God's design for our lives. The worship of demons mentioned in Revelation reminds us of the spiritual battle at hand. Satan seeks to deceive and draw people away from God's truth, enticing them to worship anything other than the one true God. This can manifest in various ways, such as idolizing material possessions, fame, power, or even engaging in occult practices that invite demonic influence. As followers of Christ, it is crucial to be vigilant and discerning. We must be aware of the subtle lies and influences of the enemy in our surroundings. Our world may be walking in a direction that embraces and normalizes the worship of demons, but as believers, we are called to stand firm in our faith and to be a light in the midst of darkness. Our task is to live according to God's word, sharing the truth and love of Christ with those around us. We must not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Through prayer, study of scripture, and reliance on the Holy Spirit, we can navigate these challenging times and be a beacon of hope in a world that desperately needs the redeeming grace of Jesus. Let us remember that God's power is greater than any force of darkness, and as we stand firmly in Him, we can resist the temptations and deceptions of Satan. In doing so, we can be a testament to His love and truth, shining a light that exposes the emptiness of worshiping anything other than the one true God. The Mighty Angel with the Little Book Time is moving. Time is moving. The whole world is on a timeline. And on that timeline, we are moving. There is a beginning and there will be an end. Time is not stationary. Neither is it moving here, there, and everywhere. There is a line and the broad thrust of history is moving along that line. There is a beginning and we are moving towards the end. And the God who created the beginning is the same God who will bring it all to end. After all, it is God's universe. He created it. It's God's universe. He will one day judge it. It's God's universe, and He will one day destroy it. 
It is God's universe and he is moving it from the beginning all the way to the end. And this broad thrust of history is something you can see if you look through history. And this is a common theme that you see in the Bible from the book of Genesis, the book of the beginnings, all the way through to the book of Revelation, the book of consummation. The scripture of the word of God has a timeline and we see prophetic events in the Old Testament that have already been fulfilled in the start of the New Testament. For instance, the prophecy regarding the Lord Jesus Christ being fulfilled. Allow me to stress this point. History and time is moving. The world may appear to be in chaos or disarray. The world may appear to be just in a random sequence of events. But one thing you as a child of God must never forget is that we are moving along a line of God's prophetic timetable. Now, within God's prophetic timeline are the seven trumpets. We see in the book of Revelation seven angels with seven trumpets step forward. These trumpet judgments are organized in a series of four and three. The first trumpet, the vegetation is struck. The second trumpet, the seas are struck. The third trumpet, the waters are struck. The fourth trumpet, the heavens are struck. The final three trumpets are referred to as the three woes. The fifth trumpet is the release of the destroyer Polyon and the locusts from the bottomless pit. The sixth trumpet is the angels from the Euphrates. Remember, there are seven trumpets and I have only listed six. I want to focus on something that happens between the sixth and seventh trumpets. Something happens between the second and third woes, or rather, someone comes in between those trumpets. And we see this in Revelation chapter 10. John saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Let us begin reading. Revelation 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little scroll open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. The Mighty Angel The first thing that John saw in chapter 10 is the appearance of an angel. This angel is a mighty angel, not just mighty as in the power, but also in the physical appearance. From the description of John, we will see that this angel is very tall and could reach the sky. Revelation chapter 10 verses 1 through 2. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. The description of this angel did not stop there. John went on to explain what his voice sounded like. The voice of this angel was like that of a roaring lion. That is completely figurative. It is not as if the angel was roaring for real. It was to say how deep and loud the voice of the angel was. This angel is so big that one foot was on the land and the other foot is on the sea. That is how huge, tall, and mighty this angel is. He has his feet on both land and sea. His stance, quote, indicates complete authority over the entire earthly situation. And this is important because bear in mind, the people of the earth are going through the earth's most calamitous time in history. And that is an understatement. This time is so calamitous that we are told in Revelation chapter 9 verse 6 that in those days shall man seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Now the next question we ask ourselves is who is this quote mighty angel the Bible speaks of in Revelation 10? The Bible does not specifically identify the mighty angel here. Some Bible commentaries believe it is Michael the archangel. 
while others believe it is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not a literal angel, but the creator of angels. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. However, the Greek word translated quote angel means messenger, and Jesus is definitely a messenger. Furthermore, the description of the mighty angel in Revelation chapter 10 verse 1 matches the description of Christ in Revelation chapter 1 verse 15 through 16. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining its strength. The mighty angel descends from heaven, quote, wrapped in a cloud, chapter 10, verse 1. And Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 associates Christ with clouds. Most Bible scholars believe that this angel is not Jesus Christ, but rather a mighty angel, perhaps Michael, the archangel. This is the school of thought I agree with. The reason why I agree with this school of thought is because angels are never clearly identified with Jesus in the book of Revelation or in the New Testament, though he is clearly associated with the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Also, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is clearly referred to in other chapters, and I don't see why John would not refer to him directly if this mighty angel was Jesus. I believe a better identification is with the angel known as Michael, because there are also similarities to this mighty angel and to Michael as he is described in Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 and chapter 12 verse 6 through 7. God is not limited with his resources. The Bible describes angels as being innumerable. It is important to note that Daniel chapter 10 verse 13 states, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me, and I remain there with the kings of Persia. The phrase, quote, Michael, one of the chief princes, suggests that if Michael is one of the chief princes, there must be more of them. Whoever this mighty angel is, he clearly comes from the very presence of God, and he has great might and authority. What did this angel do? He had a scroll in his hand. Imagine an angel that tall holding a scroll. Just envision an angel of that size and magnitude, one foot on land, one foot on sea. When this angel spoke, the seven thunders uttered their voices. John said he was about to write these things, but then a voice from heaven told him not to write any of the things. Isn't this amazing that there is a part of the book of Revelation that we don't know, a part of the future that is still sealed, a part of the future that is still veiled in mystery. Just what is uttered by these seven thunders, no one really knows. So there are seven things that are not even in the Bible. God didn't want us to know this. But I ask myself, this seems so important, why would God not want us to know this? Then my mind went back to two scriptures, to two wonderful Bible verses. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Apparently, what the seven thunders uttered would not have been, quote, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, end quote. BibleRef.com expands on this point, saying this deliberate omission also reminds us of an important fact. Mankind does not know everything. Behind the scenes, in ways we cannot imagine or understand, God is acting and working. This verse is a perfect example of this concept in action. God tells us what He wants us to know and what we need to know. Just because we do not see or do not understand does not mean something is not happening. The second verse I thought about is Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Whatever John heard and was asked to seal, the reason is best known to God. 
We don't know when this mighty angel will come, but we do know he is coming. The Bible reveals to us quite clearly that there are forces at play which go quite literally beyond our natural eyes. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul the Apostle used a variety of terms to refer to these spiritual enemies, and what one of the lessons we can learn from this scripture is, is that there is a lot more going on than what meets the naked eye. Unfortunately, many Christians avoid the topic of the spirit realm for many reasons, one of which is that they believe that anything to do with the spirit world means you are venturing into fanatical territory. However, this is incorrect. The Bible teaches that there is a very real spiritual realm. The Bible teaches the existence of an immaterial, spiritual reality unseen by human eyes. The spiritual realm consists of both good, God and the holy angels, and evil, the devil and his demons. The devil and his demons play an active role in the earth that we live in today. Now within scripture, particularly in the book of Revelation, we see the topic of the mark of the beast, quote 666. This mark of the beast acts as a seal for the followers of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now, we have all heard of this mark, but what a lot of people don't know is what is so important about this mark. And why does the dragon, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet all want the inhabitants of the earth to receive this mark? The answer is simple, and it is referred to five times in Revelation chapter 13 and three times between Revelation chapter 14, verses 7 through 11. What the dragon, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet all want is one word, worship. What if I was to tell you that the issue surrounding the mark of the beast has already started, and unfortunately, most people don't see it yet? What if I was to tell you that the issue surrounding the mark of the beast started long before you and I were created? To understand this, we have to begin with the fall. Chapter 1, The Fall, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Isaiah witnessed the fall and the events that preceded it. The prophet witnessed the highest of God's angel try to usurp the throne of God and capture for himself worship that belonged to God and to God alone. This passage is often referred to as, quote, the five I wills of Satan. The statements reveal Satan's sinful nature, his rebellion, his disobedience, his self-sufficiency, his pride, his exaltation, and most importantly, his hunger and thirst to be worshipped. Allow me to read to you the five statements. 1. I will ascend into heaven. 2. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 3. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. 4. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. 5. I will be like the Most High. These five statements show the very heart of Lucifer, and they reveal the most important desire of his satanic heart, and that is one thing, worship. All of heaven adores God Almighty. All of heaven worships God Almighty. But that is because worship and adoration belong to him and him alone. Chapter 2, The Temptation The devil tempted Jesus Christ in three separate temptations. The first temptation was to turn stones into bread. Satan said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus replied, Men shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The second temptation was to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple, trusting that the angels would save him. Satan said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus replied, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The third temptation is the one we are focusing on. Matthew chapter 4 verses 8 through 11. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. What did the devil want from Jesus? He wanted him to worship him and kneel before him. Satan offered the kingdoms of this world because they are in his hands to give. This is why the Bible describes him as the God of what? The God of this world. But what meant more to him than the very kingdoms of this world? One word, worship. This is a revealing insight into Satan's heart. Worship and recognition are far more precious to him than the possessions of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Go back to chapter 1 when we spoke about his fall. He wanted to be like the Most High because he wanted the worship that the Most High receives. Chapter 3, The Mark There are three primary characters who look to enforce the mark. In some Christian circles, they are referred to as the evil trinity. The concept of the evil trinity is not explicitly mentioned in the book of Revelation. However, some theologians and scholars have suggested that there may be a parallel between the concept of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and a group of three evil figures mentioned in the book of Revelation. These three figures, or powers, are often identified as the dragon, also known as Lucifer, the first beast, also known as the Antichrist, and the second beast, also known as the false prophet, all of which are mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. Together, they represent the forces of evil that seek the worship that rightly belongs to God. The dragon represents Lucifer, who seeks to deceive and steal worship that belongs to God. The Antichrist is primarily a political and military leader. The false prophet is a religious leader. The false prophet will cause the world to worship the Antichrist as if he were God. He will direct the world to worship at his feet and accept his mark. So his power will not just be the power that is political or military or economic. He will have great religious power because the false prophet will convince the world that this Antichrist is God and is the only hope of the salvation of the world that is going to be going through the Great Tribulation. And he will do this by using coercion and deception. And the world will accept this lie they will bow down and worship the Antichrist as if he were God, and they will be destroyed and damned with him in the lake of fire. So in simple terms, the false prophet will direct worship to the Antichrist. Earlier in this message, I stated that five times in Revelation chapter 13 is the central issue of the mark of the beast mentioned. Allow me to read those verses to you. Revelation chapter 13 verse 4 and they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 13 verse 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Revelation chapter 13 verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Lucifer's objective has always been to be worshipped, 
and the mark of the beast is when his objective will come to fruition for a brief period of time on earth. Look at the response of our Lord and Savior during the temptation. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Notice that Satan said nothing about service, but our Lord knew the one whom you worship is the one in whom you serve. The holy angels worship the Lord, and they serve him. We believers worship the Lord, and we serve him. This is why I am saying the issue regarding the mark of the beast has already started. Because simply put, the issue regarding the mark of the beast is an issue of worship. And the issue of worship started when Satan wanted to exalt himself above the Most High. In the end times, the mark of the beast will be a literal mark that people will put on their foreheads and right hands, which will signify who they worship. The mark of the beast has not arrived yet, but the central issue surrounding the mark of the beast is already at play in the world today. And that central issue is one of worship. We are living in the book of Revelation, and the book of Revelation speaks to our generation, and it is calling each and every one of us to make a decision and commit to whom we will worship. In the life of every human being, there is a yearning to worship. Human nature must have something to worship. I saw a wonderful quote regarding the need that mankind has for worship and the need to believe in something. The quote stated, Some faith exists in all men. Faith in the supernatural, faith in the mystical, faith in the psychic, faith in something that is divine or something that is invisible. Man is an incurable worshiper. He needs somebody beyond himself to believe in, even if he can't identify who it is, even if it is somewhat nebulous. And this need for worship is what the false prophet will seek to exploit. The false prophet will be a false prophet and preacher, the likes of which the world has never seen. He will sway billions of people on this earth into the worship of one human being, who is energized by the very power of hell. One of the reasons he will be able to do this is because he will be able to back up his claims with lying wonders. All of this will come together simply to obtain the worship of the people of this world. The one and only thing Satan has always wanted has been worship. And for a brief period of time, he will get what he wanted. The central issue of the mark of the beast is an issue of worship. God is calling you today to make a commitment, to make a decision who you will worship. God is calling us to be faithful. God is calling his people to not compromise on the word of God, to seek righteousness, to seek holiness, to depart from all unrighteousness, to depart from all iniquity, to stand strong in the name of Jesus Christ, to understand that no matter what the world may throw at us, no matter the persecution we may face in life, we will be victorious because God has exalted him. God has highly exalted the name of Jesus Christ. And if we are in Christ, we are victorious. If we are in Christ, there is no defeat. If we are in Christ, the victory is ours through the name of Jesus. But as the children of God, we must take a stand we as the end time church must not waver in our faith. So I call on you, Church of Jesus Christ, to stand up and be counted and make a commitment just like Joshua and say other people in this world may worship other gods, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But for me and my house, we will praise the Lord. But for me and my house, we will worship the living God through the only door that we have been given, and that door is Jesus Christ. The matter of the mark of the beast is a significant one that needs to be taken seriously. This issue is intrinsically tied to worship. It symbolizes your object of devotion, and to whom you affiliate it signifies who you worship and who you belong to. It signifies ownership. The concern of the mark of the beast denotes your irreversible loyalty to a specific kingdom. Fundamentally, 
those who accept this mark align themselves with Satan and renounce God for eternity. Revelation 14 verses 9 to 10 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. Despite the warning of the angel of God against accepting the mark of the beast, many people will still go ahead and accept the mark because of a number of reasons. In this sermon, we will explore the diverse motivations that lead people to accept the mark. Reason number one, refusing the mark will lead to financial ruin. Anyone refusing to take the mark will struggle to survive. Revelation 13 verses 16 to 17, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. The Antichrist will occupy such a position of high influence that he will hold sway over the world and all its economic operations. Under the beast's governance, his mark will become the singularly accepted means of financial exchange. This situation will exert tremendous pressure on individuals, impelling them towards accepting the mark. It won't be a free choice made from personal will. Instead, the beast will employ strong-arm tactics. This characteristic of the devil is important to understand. The devil thrives on coercion. If he can compel you to act, he will. In contrast, God permits an individual to make a decision and then lets them face the repercussions of their choices. Even though people are aware that receiving the mark of the beast means eternal separation from God, they will still go ahead and take the mark. Consider a father needing to feed his family. How many will be able to bear the distress of being unable to buy or sell? Withstanding the hardship of your family failing to make ends meet is a challenging ordeal. Coercion As many fall in line with the Antichrist's tune, even more people who had been willing to resist it will find their faith wavering. People will observe others around them successfully caring for their families while they struggle due to their refusal to accept the mark. This pressure will force many individuals to comply with his mark. Indeed, coercion is one of Satan's most potent strategies, and it will be blatantly manifest during the period of the Great Tribulation and the introduction of the Mark of the Beast. The devil capitalizes on desperation and vulnerability, exploiting these moments to pressurize individuals into actions they might not willingly choose. During these trying times, the devil's craft of manipulation will be unveiled in its full intensity, compelling many to accept the mark. With his cunning manipulation, the devil will use desperation and fear as tools, pushing individuals to the point where they feel they have no other option but to comply. Reason number two why people will take mark is because of persecution. The Antichrist will possess the ability to monitor those who do not accept the mark of the beast. He will function like Nebuchadnezzar who found out that there were three Hebrew men who refused to bow down to his graven image and cast them into his blazing furnace. The Antichrist will persecute anyone who chooses to stand for the truth. People who refuse to take his mark will be effectively cast out society. It's going to be a world for only those who accept the mark of the beast while others will have to face severe persecution. It is in the face of this persecution that many will renounce their faith. For those of us residing in developed nations like the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and many others, being Christian has been relatively straightforward for centuries, especially compared to some other nations. There exist countries where confessing one's faith in Christ could cost you your life. However, in this country, we don't encounter that degree of persecution, yet some of us will renounce Christ merely for the sake of being liked. There are individuals who conceal their faith to maintain popularity. 
I am aware of Christians who obscure their belief in Jesus Christ solely to gain acceptance from the world, or so that the world does not view them as strange. Now, contemplate how many more individuals might hide or repudiate their faith when embracing and professing their faith could lead to tangible persecution, real persecution such as a loss of employment, income, or social status. If people nowadays can't withstand societal pressures to maintain the appearance of fitting in, how will people stand up against more serious challenges and real persecution which will come during the Great Tribulation? The upcoming era will be an even more formidable test, with the Antichrist's coercion tactics driving the world towards accepting the mark of the beast. There will be a palpable threat that accepting and voicing your faith will result in dire consequences. Now the last three reasons why people will accept the mark is centered around deception. Satan is the deceiver. Reason number three, many false prophets will come and go, but none of them will compare to the false prophet spoken of in. Revelation 16 verses 13 to 14, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Right from Bible times, there has been a serious warning against the ministry of false prophets. Up till now, we still have several false prophets in the world. Many false prophets will come and go, but none of them can be compared with the false prophet spoken of in this passage. He is described to be some sort of religious leader who will point the world to the Antichrist, to love him and adore him. Every other false prophet seems to be the forerunner of the one who is to come. The coming prophet is the third person in the unholy trinity. He will promote the interest of Satan and the beast. He will be at the forefront to divert the hearts of people to worship the image of the beast. No other prophet has this influence over the whole world. Reason number four, deception. The Antichrist will come in peace at first. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The Antichrist, as described in Revelation, will initially present himself as a figure of peace. He will perform numerous miracles, persuading people to trust in him through his supernatural actions. The world will embrace him, cherish him. He will position himself as the answer to the world's problems. This point cannot be overstated. The world will love him. As stated in the book of John, his spirit already permeates the earth. I have no doubt that this spirit is at work, priming people's hearts and preparing society to adore him when he arrives. Contrary to popular belief, the Antichrist will not manifest as a literal beast as depicted in Revelation. Instead, he will appear as a man, a man the world will admire and worship. Some will willingly accept the mark out of sincere belief in him because he will brazenly elevate himself to the level of God. He will demand to be revered above all else, situating himself in God's temple and proclaiming his divinity. This level of idolatry is unprecedented, and the gravity of its implications cannot be overstated. His manipulation will reach such depths that many will not only accept his rule, but will also celebrate it, enchanted by his charisma and the illusion of peace he brings. They will willingly surrender their freedom and morality, all in the name of following this seemingly divine figure. He will appear as God to some, and some people will take the mark for this very reason. Can you take the mark of the beast accidentally? I received an email asking this question. Can you take the mark of the beast accidentally? To answer this question, let us look at biblical prophecy. The prophets of old, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, detailed to us events that will occur leading up to the second coming of Jesus. The rising of false prophets, 
nations waging war against one another, the love of the believers waxing cold, and the deceiving of many believers are all end-time events that the prophets of old have prophesied about. But today, we are going to look at a prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Mark chapter 13, verse 10, also confirms this truth. Mark chapter 13, verse 10, And the gospel must first be published among all nations. These two scriptures stated plainly that the Lord Jesus would not appear until the gospel is preached all over the nations of the earth. Therefore, the gospel will be preached in all tongues, kindred, tribes, and countries of the world. No exception. Everyone in every tribe, family, and language will have the opportunity to accept Christ or reject Him. The ISO, quote, country codes, standards, details that we have more than 240 countries in the world with their states and capitals. A bulk of these countries have a population as big as over a hundred million in them. This great mass of people is scattered all over the world in their various locations irrespective of the enormity of the entire world population and numerous geographic areas, the prophecy of God's word concerning the end time still says that the gospel shall be preached all over the nations of the world. Looking at this goal ordinarily, the mission seems quite unrealistic and rather impossible because of the rigorous task involved in carrying out the preaching of the gospel to all nations. Yes, Technological advances have helped to spread the gospel. However, the internet is censored in some nations and the gospel is not allowed in those countries. Furthermore, there are places where people don't even have the internet and there are places which are remote and difficult to reach. There are even countries where preaching the gospel is outlawed. And in those countries, the people of that nation do not even know who Jesus Christ is or what the Bible is. Therefore, Jesus' statement that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, appears rather far-fetched. Often, God's word looks doubtful, but the truth is that God will forever be true to his word. If he has said it, yes, he will do it. Now, one thing you need to remember about God is that God has resources that you and I know absolutely nothing about. We tend to think that only missionaries and technology will be able to preach the gospel in those remote places. God's ways are higher than our ways. Let us travel into the book of Revelation to a chapter that is full of angels. In all honesty, the book of Revelation shows us a tremendous amount of angelic activity, such as the world has never seen before. For instance, the seven trumpets are sounded by seven angels and the events that follow are described in detail from Revelation chapters 8 to 11. Revelation chapter 9 reveals to us the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Revelation chapter 10 reveals to us the mighty angel with a little book. In Revelation chapter 12, we see the archangel Michael, the defender of Israel, but we are not focusing on any of these angels. We are focusing on the three angels in chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 through 13 brings us the proclamations from heaven made by three different angels. In this passage, John receives a vision of three angels flying in the sky, each carrying a different message. Here we have something that is unusual. Here we have something that has never ever happened before. Never in the history of mankind has there been an event like this. Never in the history of mankind have angels been seen flying. Three angels fly through the sky, each of them calling out their messages. One brings the gospel and a call to worship God. The second brings an announcement of the fall of Babylon. The third warns of the wrath of God upon all who worship the beast and have his mark upon them. 
when the world is taking its final nosedive and the Antichrist and the false prophet are at their most prominent, God goes to unusual lengths. God goes to lengths that he has never gone to before to warn the world. He warns the final generation to fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. But interestingly enough, the third angel warns humanity not to take the mark of the beast. This third angel's announcement warns that a terrible fate awaits those who persist in worshipping the Antichrist. This angel highlights the connection between worshipping the beast and his image and receiving his mark on your forehead or on your hand. In plainer words, taking the mark of the beast will be a declaration of worship. No one will accidentally take the mark of the beast. The connection between worshipping the beast and taking the mark will be clear. We see once again God in his great grace and mercy calls sinners to repent in the final hour or they will face the terrible judgment of the Antichrist. Those who drank the harlot's wine of the passions of her immorality will also drink the wine of the wrath of God. To drink the wine of the wrath of God is to experience his wrath. So who are these angels and what message do they bring on earth? These angels are not just ordinary angels, but they are three special angels sent by God to deliver a crucial message to the people on earth. The first angel comes to proclaim the everlasting gospel, calling all people to fear and worship God. Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 through 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. The wonderful thing is that this angel will fly around the sky close enough to the earth to be seen and heard by all humanity. I don't know how God has this worked out, but the angel will be able to preach the everlasting gospel and communicate with every tongue. So language won't be a barrier for this angel. It is possible that this angel will be able to speak the native language of whatever country he is flying over at the same time. Possibly, if he's flying over France, he will speak French. If he's flying over Portugal, he will speak Portuguese. We don't know the specifics. However, what we do know for sure is that this angel will be able to communicate with everyone. This angel proclaims the gospel of God to everyone on earth, regardless of tribe, race, and status. The angel reminds the inhabitants of the earth of the coming judgment and instructs them to worship and fear the Lord. He alone is to be glorified and worshiped. He made it clear in Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 that we should not worship any other God of whatsoever form for whatsoever reason but Him. This message calls all people to recognize God as the creator of the universe and the one who deserves our worship and obedience. The first angel's message is not only a call to worship and to fear God, but also an invitation to receive the salvation that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. A call to fear the Lord is a call to obey Him, to shun sin, to walk in His will, to walk in righteousness, and to do everything that pleases Him. This angel proclaims loudly, for the hour of His judgment has come, and this message of judgment will be heard by many across the world. A great multitude will come to know Christ as Savior during this period, because the judgment of God is so evident on earth during this time of the Great Tribulation. It is no wonder why the crowd of those saved through the Great Tribulation can't be numbered. The second angel announces the fall of Babylon, which is a symbolic reference to the corrupt systems of the world. Babylon is God's name for the world system of the Antichrist, the entire economic and political organization by which he rules. These systems are known to oppose the will of God. Revelation chapter 14 verse 8, 
And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The announcement of Babylon's downfall in Revelation does not signify the end of the Great Tribulation, but is rather an announcement of the future destruction of Babylon in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. The various pronouncements of this chapter are not necessarily a record that an event has taken place, but that the event is impending. In other words, the event of the fall of Babylon is impending, and we will see its actual fall later in the book of Revelation. The term, quote, Babylon in scripture refers to the ungodly and sinful nature of the world as much as anything else. The system of evil known as Babylon, which is promoted by the beast and false prophet, is destined for destruction. Finally, the third angel pronounces the wrath of God upon those who have rejected him and worshiped the beast. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 11. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. The prophecy of the third angel followed immediately after the first and the second angel prophesied. The prophecy of the third angel is that of a warning against the worship of the Antichrist. This message is a warning of the consequences of turning away from God and taking the mark of the beast. God's wrath is not something to be taken lightly. The mark of the beast is a symbol of allegiance to the Antichrist and the systems of the world that are opposed to God. Those who take the mark will face the wrath of God. They will drink of the wine of God's wrath. The warning from the third angel clearly reminds us that there is a connection between worshiping the beast and his image and receiving his mark on your forehead or on your hand. No one will casually or accidentally take the mark. God will clearly warn the inhabitants of the earth of the eternal consequences of receiving the mark. The connection between worshiping the beast and taking the mark will be clear enough for everyone to see and everyone to know. The people of earth will have the choice to receive the mark and it is important to note that during this period of time, it will be the normal thing to do within society to receive the mark. Because remember in chapter 13, we are told that an individual will be unable to buy or sell without the mark. Revelation chapter 13 verses 16 through 17. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Receiving the mark will appear to be the quote easy way, but it will actually be the hard way for going along with the world and pledging allegiance to the Antichrist through his mark will mean permanently turning your back on God for all of eternity. Those who take the mark will experience the full wrath of God without limit. It is important to note that God will have repeatedly warned sinners time and time again regarding taking the mark and rejecting the gospel. God will time and time again give sinners the opportunity to repent. Whilst the world is at its worst and the Antichrist is at his height of power, God will send his two witnesses he will send these three angels we have spoken about today, and all of them will warn sinners and call them to repentance. If people persist in their sinful ways and even persist to reject the gospel message as they are literally seeing the book of Revelation unfolding before their own eyes, then they will have no one to blame for all of eternity except themselves. What happens after Jesus returns? The Millennial Reign, Revelation chapter 20, verses 3 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. 
and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Jesus Christ shall reign on earth for a thousand years. There are some theologians who believe that this thousand years is symbolic and not literally a thousand year period. I firmly believe that it is a literal thousand years. The reason being that six times in Revelation chapter 20 verses 2 through 7, that term, 1,000 years, is explicitly and specifically mentioned. If God wanted to communicate a long period of time, rather than 1,000 years specifically, he could have easily done so without repeatedly mentioning the exact time frame of 1,000 years. Can you imagine 1,000 years with Christ as our ruler? A world with no fear? A world where you will not need to lock your doors at night? A world with the perfect physical and spiritual environment? That is what the Millennial Kingdom will be like. For a thousand years with Jesus as our ruler, there will be peace, complete and utter peace on the earth. Take a moment to ponder on what the Millennial reign with Christ Jesus will be like and imagine that all the turmoil has come to an end. The conflicts have ceased and there is no longer any more selfishness on the earth. There is no more pain nor sorrow. This is not the temporary and deceitful three and a half years of peace that the Antichrist is foretold to usher during the first period of the Great Tribulation. No, we are beyond that. I want you to see in your mind the revelation given to John in chapter 20. We find in Revelation 20 that God mentions the millennium six times. From verse 2 to verse 7, God says 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years. And in three of those verses, he refers to this period of time as, quote, the thousand years. Can you imagine what the world will be like with Jesus as its ruler for 1,000 years? And the world will finally be in a practical state of utopia because Christ will be reigning. And during this 1,000 years, Satan will be bound. Can you imagine what this 1,000 years with Jesus will be like? It will be a time of peace, a time of joy, and a time of real prosperity for all those on the earth. Amazingly, we see in the millennial reign that there will be two groups of people, those with glorified physical bodies and those with natural earthly bodies. The people with natural bodies who are on earth during this period would have survived the great tribulation, which should not be taken lightly. As we see in the book of Revelation, large cohorts of the earth's population are killed during the events of the Great Tribulation. Revelation chapter 9 verse 18 By these three plagues a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. So now that the saints are reigning with Jesus on earth, as I stated there will also be the survivors of the Great Tribulation, and these survivors of the Great Tribulation will see the goodness righteousness and holiness of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will experience the 1,000 years with Jesus. What is surprising is that some of these people that will experience this wonderful 1,000 years with Jesus will decide to participate in a rebellion against Jesus once Satan is loosed on the earth at the end of the 1,000 year period. However, today we are not focusing on that. We today are focusing on how wonderful and how glorious the millennial reign will be. Magnificent things will happen during this period. 
The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 through 10 saw a glimpse of the 1,000 years and offered a very clear picture of this future for us. Isaiah chapter 11 verses 6 through 9. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What is described here is a complete change of the animal kingdom, a time where the very nature of wild animals will be changed. No longer will there be predators among the animals, and it seems that all animals will be herbivores or plant eaters. Not only will the way animals interact with one another change, but the way they interact with humans will also be transformed. A child will walk among animals like wolves, leopards, bears, and lions in safety with no fear. If I was to be anywhere near a wild cat right now, I would be nervous, folks. Have you ever seen how fast a cheetah is or how strong a bear is? I would be pretty nervous, but there is a coming time where children will be able to walk peacefully with animals like this. The last phrase in Isaiah states, quote, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. End quote. Can you imagine a world like that? From continent to continent, men are going to know the Lord. From sea to shining sea, men are going to know the Lord. Not only will the animal kingdom be changed, but the state of our lives will be changed. There will be death in the millennial earth, but in the transformed biology and ecology of the world under the reign of Jesus Christ, people will live incredibly longer, as they did in the days before the flood. I want to introduce the son of Enoch, Methuselah, who is known for being the oldest man in the Bible. He lived to be 969. The Bible tells us that this age will be a normal occurrence for people during this time. We are told that health will improve that much. The millennial reign of the Messiah will be glorious. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 20, No more shall an infant from there live but a few days nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. If someone dies during this period at the age of 100 years old, they are considered a child. Wrap that around your head. This world where Christ will be the ruler will be completely different to this world we live in now. There will be people born in this millennial reign of Christ Jesus and all they will ever know is the wonderful world with Christ as their ruler. It almost sounds like a dream, doesn't it? It makes you wish that it was here today, doesn't it? All these people will know is a long life growing old with their loved ones. Imagine a world where people know their great, 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 great grandparents. Grandparents love their grandchildren. Grandparents absolutely adore their grandchildren. Now imagine being able to see generation after generation of their offspring. Wonderful. That will be possible during the millennial reign because of the length of people's lives. It almost sounds like a dream, doesn't it? It makes you wish that it was here today, doesn't it? Aren't you tired of this world and all of its sin, death, and destruction? I look forward to living in a world where the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting in Jerusalem on the throne of David, and the joy of the Lord covers the face of the earth. Not only will we be able to live longer and healthier lives, and we'll be able to walk amongst animals we wouldn't go anywhere near today. Society will be safer. Children will be able to play on streets. People won't have to lock their doors. Life will be lived without fear. People will be able to walk home at night with no fear. As a father, I've had to speak to my children and warn them about how sick and how mean and how ruthless this world is. But during the reign of Christ, this world will be safe. Parents won't need to make such cold, 
but necessary talks to their daughters or sons. Praise God. Praise God. Doesn't that make you wish it was today? Somewhere safe for your children. Even so, come Lord Jesus Christ. Even so, Lord, come today. Our minds cannot understand the complete, utter bliss we will experience. King Jesus, in his righteous rulership, I praise God for this prophecy. Take hope, brothers and sisters, that we will reign with our Lord and Savior in this reality and in front of those who are alive at that time. The kingdom of the Lord will come to earth as it is in heaven. The Great Tribulation will culminate in the Last War. Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 through 10. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The millennial reign is the 1,000 year period of peace and righteousness following the second coming of Jesus Christ, who will reign over the earth during this time. During the reign of Christ Jesus on earth, Satan will be bound and sealed in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and he will have no influence over the earth to deceive mankind. That old serpent, which is the devil, that old serpent, which has plagued mankind, will have absolutely no influence on the world for 1,000 years. Can you imagine what the world will be like? Can you imagine 1,000 years of complete and utter peace? Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost, in his book, Things to Come, states, quote, the millennium will be the period of the full manifestation of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be the manifestation of glory associated with the humanity of Christ. There will be the glory of the glorious dominion in which Christ, by virtue of his obedience unto death, is given universal dominion to replace that dominion which Adam lost. There will be the glory of a glorious government in which Christ, as David's son, is given absolute power to govern. There will be the glory of a glorious inheritance in which the land and the seed promised to Abraham are realized through Christ." End quote. Once the 1,000 years have elapsed, Satan will be released. And once he is released, he resumes his intense opposition to God and God's people. We see that Satan organizes an army that consists of the people of the earth in another rebellion against God. Satan raises his last army. The question arises, if Jesus has reigned so wonderfully for a thousand years, then why will some people on the earth uprise against him? They will do it, and God will allow it, as a final demonstration of man's rebellion and depravity. After a thousand years of living in a thriving, perfectly righteous, perfectly prosperous, Christ-ruled world, people will still uprise against God. Imagine that. Although people will live in a perfect world, people will still uprise against God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. When has this happened before? The Garden. Adam and Eve lived in a wonderful utopian world with God, but yet they rebelled against him. And the people who will live during this 1,000 year period and the people who are born during this 1,000 years will not know anything other than the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Outwardly, they will conform, but inwardly, inwardly, their hearts will be full of rebellion. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now what surprises me 
is that these people who will be deceived and recruited into the army of Satan are not a few in number, but they are a great multitude that cannot be numbered. The Bible states the following regarding the vast size and scale of Satan's army, quote, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, end quote. This boggles my mind every time I read this passage of scripture, because I cannot understand how Satan can recruit so many people after 1,000 years of perfect peace. It does not make sense to me. It baffles my mind. But then again, this shows how powerful Satan's deception is and will be during this period. There are some atheists and agnostics who state the following line, quote, I would believe in God and even follow him if I had proof he existed or if I saw him, end quote. No, you wouldn't. That is a lie. No, you wouldn't. And this period will prove it. Although people will physically see the Lord Jesus Christ, they will still rebel against him. I struggle to understand a person who rebels against the Lord after seeing him in his glory and all his beauty and all of his kindness. We can see another example of how hard mankind's heart can be against God. The Bible states that during the Great Tribulation, People will know the reason why all of these disastrous events are happening, but rather than repenting and seeking forgiveness from the Lord, men shall seek death. Revelation chapter 6 verse 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. This proves the fact God doesn't send anyone to hell or anyone to heaven. Individuals are given the choice, and they choose heaven or choose hell. The rich man, whilst in the depths of hell, attempted to get Father Abraham to send someone from the dead to preach to his brothers. However, Father Abraham said, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Even in our world today, there is evidence and proof of God. Christianity is not a faith built on blind faith. There is real, tangible evidence that shows the reality of God. Unfortunately, people decide not to seek for the evidence that can be found. In addition to this, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Christianity is an extremely rational faith. I encourage you to read a book written by Norman Geisler and Frank Turek called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And in this book, you will discover the reliability of the New Testament accounts concerning Jesus. Back to the end of the millennial reign of Christ Jesus. Of course, there will be a lot of people that will be born during the millennial reign of Christ Jesus, and they will have no idea what it's like to live in a world with the devil, to live in a world like the world we live in today. They will not know the world we know full of crime, greed, deceit, and backbiting. However, there will be a great multitude who have lived through the millennial reign of Christ Jesus who will be in this army of Satan. Revelation chapter 20 verse 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This great vast army that Satan has gathered is destroyed with fire that comes from heaven. This great and vast army doesn't even so much as put up a fight against the Lord. This is something we need to understand clearly. Satan is not the opposite of God. People tend to view Satan as the opposite of God or the opposite equal to God. He is not the opposite equal to God. Yes, in some aspects, he is the opposite. God is light and Satan is darkness. God is good, Satan is evil. However, when it comes to power, Satan is not even in the league of God. The Lord God Almighty is in a classification of his own. Satan, you must remember, is a created being, whilst the Lord God Almighty is the father of creation. God is all-powerful, and Satan is powerful, but he is not all-powerful. And this is evident in how easily and how quickly Satan's vast and great army is completely and utterly devoured 
without even amounting any resistance. And we see in the very next verse that the devil is cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. At the beginning of the 1,000 years, the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. These two are both cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. It is interesting to note that these two are rightly the first two people to be cast into the lake of fire, but they are the only two individuals who are not judged before going there. Everyone else cast into the lake of fire goes through the great white throne judgment first. However, these two are placed into the lake of fire alive, and they are later on joined by Satan. Notice how the Bible clearly tells us in Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 that in this lake of fire, the Antichrist and the false prophet are there. I think this is to show us the fact this place is an eternal place. It is a place where people do not cease to exist, but rather are there forever and ever. Eternity is forever. We are eternal beings. The book of Revelation is a fascinating and thought-provoking part of the Bible. It is filled with prophetic events and mysterious visions, but it concludes with a heartfelt longing expressed by the author, John. John eagerly anticipates the return of Jesus for his people, a moment commonly referred to as the rapture of the church. This longing resonates deeply within the hearts of every Christian as they too eagerly await the coming of the Lord. The return of Jesus marks both the beginning of the end and the beginning of forever. It signifies the culmination of God's plan for humanity and the ultimate fulfillment of his promises. Christians believe that Jesus will return to gather his followers, both living and deceased, and take them to be with him in eternal glory. The anticipation of this glorious event is not limited to John alone, but is shared by believers throughout history. The Bible reassures Christians that the Lord's return is certain, and they eagerly await the day when they will be united with their Savior. This expectation brings hope, comfort, and a sense of purpose to their lives. The thought of the Lord's return stirs a variety of emotions within the hearts of Christians. It inspires a deep longing to be in the presence of Jesus, to experience his love and grace in its fullness. It also ignites a sense of urgency to share the message of salvation with others as time is perceived to be running out. The basic message is clear, Jesus will come again. This assurance is a source of comfort and encouragement for believers, especially during times of trials and tribulations. It reminds them that their current struggles are temporary and that a glorious future awaits them in the presence of their Savior. In light of the imminent return of Jesus, Christians are encouraged to live with a sense of anticipation and preparedness. They are called to be vigilant, faithful, and to continue to spread the message of God's love and salvation to the world. The expectation of Jesus' return serves as a reminder to prioritize spiritual matters, to live according to God's commands, and to love others unconditionally. Revelation 22, 17-20 And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst, Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He which testify these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The last prayer written in the Bible encompasses all that a Christian hopes for. It's a prayer prompted by Jesus' sure testimony, the testimony that Jesus is coming quickly, and when he comes, he will bring the conclusion of all things. He will judge all men, and that he is the sovereign over all of history. That is the final promise to his children. Three times in the closing chapter of Revelation, John wrote, I, Christ, come quickly. 
allow me to read those verses to you. Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22, 12. And, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation 22, 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The book of Revelation starts with John telling us that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and its end tells us that the Christ that is revealed in the book of Revelation is the one that is coming quickly. But it's been 2,000 years since he said this. How is he coming quickly? 2 Peter 3, 9-10 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now delay in his coming is only to give this sinful world the opportunity to repent. Now in the heart of every believer, we are to long and desire for his coming, the coming of the Lord God Almighty. We are to desire him, to long after him. And I believe that every person is born with a desire for God, a longing and a desire for God. There is a void in humanity, a void that only the Lord Jesus Christ can fill. This is why you see so many people trying to fill that longing with stuff. They acquire and buy more and more stuff, but that longing is still there. There are those who attempt to fill that void with sex. They sleep with this one and that one, and each time they give themselves to someone, they feel more and more empty. There are those who will attempt to fill the void with drugs and alcohol. There are those who attempt to fill that void with the opposite sex, and it never works. My friend, you need Jesus. Real life comes from Him. He is described as the living one. All life flows from Him. If you are tired of the life you are living, give yourself to Jesus, and your perspective will change. Your view of time and eternity will change. Your view of things that really matter will change. You will understand that my life on this earth is a vapor, but my life with Christ is eternal. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. There are those who attempt to fill the void in their life with money. They exalt money above God, but they are still empty. Do you know there are billionaires who are unhappy? There are millionaires who are miserable? Oh yes. Let us not lie, money can buy you things that you've always wanted. Money can remove the stress of paying bills, and it can do a lot for you. Money can really improve your standard of living. But there are lots of things money can't do for you. Money can't buy you love. You know, real love. Love where you know that if money was to go, this person would still be there for me. Money can't buy you immortality. Do you know how rich people die? Just like poor people. Money is not the answer you are searching and longing for. Give yourself to Jesus. He is what you need. Give yourself to Jesus. He alone is the one that will complete you. Give yourself to him. Submit before him. Draw nigh unto him, and he will draw nigh unto you. You have never experienced real love until you have come to know who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for you. How does that make you feel? that God wants to spend eternity with you. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, the last prayer in the Bible. It's a prayer that has eternal significance in that Jesus' testimony provides a grand summary of the whole book of Revelation. This wonderful prayer is one in which we all know will be answered. It's a prayer that confirms everything that God does. God's name will finally be appreciated by everything in heaven and on earth, which includes all of his divine attributes, his goodness, wisdom, and justice. It is obvious to anyone living on earth that our difficult days are too long and our good days are too short. This is why so many people today all believe in heaven and have a longing for it. Let us be honest, this life is not fair. Not everyone gets the same opportunities as one another. This life is not fair. Not everyone gets the same breakthroughs as others. Life is not fair. Some people are just born with better advantages than others. Some people are just born with the right last name or in a better part of the world. Life is not fair. But the Lord Jesus Christ did not come to make life fair. He came to redeem us so that we can spend eternal life with him 
And to that all I can say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. I encourage you today to look forward to heaven because we will get to see the Lord, we will finally be able to hug him and bow before him. Just imagine the feeling you will have when you finally see Jesus, seeing him who died for you, seeing him, the one who knows everything about you, seeing him who knows your shortcomings, failures, faults, mistakes, and sins, yet he still loves you. And to that, all I can say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Just imagine the sensation that you will have when you see a hole in his hand, the hole they nailed him to the cross on, then seeing him seated at the right hand of the Father. Reading the gospel accounts of Jesus' time on earth should make anyone desire to walk with him. Just imagine being comforted by Jesus' encouraging words to have all your tears wiped away. There is someone who has been crying for a while now. Even if tears were not coming out of your eyes, you have been crying. I just want to remind you that God will wipe away your tears. The pain of this life is but for a moment. This pain will not last forever. You are not always going to feel this way. You are not always going to feel so, so stressed. And to that all I can say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Does that not make you excited to know that one day everything that is hurting me here on earth will be over? And all you will experience for all of eternity is the atmosphere of heaven. You will look up and all you will be able to see is angels as far as the eye can see. The closest thing to hell a child of God experiences in this life we live is now. For the place you are going to is a place of complete joy and continual happiness. The place you are going to, you will be given a wonderful, wonderful body. As an apostle, God had revealed special things to Paul. He said that he was actually caught up to the third heaven and he actually saw many of these things. 2 Corinthians 12, 3-4 And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. Paul refers to our body as being an earthly tent, which refers to the house that we are living in while we are here on earth. Picture yourself going camping and living inside a tent. You will quickly come to the understanding that no matter the high quality of the tent or the price of the tent, they are by design very fragile. Any storm, be it rain or wind that starts pounding or when the snow starts to fall, you will quickly realize your tent is not a replacement for a permanent house. Our bodies are fragile. Our bodies get sick. Our bodies get tired. Our bodies get old. Our bodies get frail and they are very weak, they are fragile. At the present, while we are all here on earth, our body is such a weak tent. It doesn't have permanent stability. Every single one of our bodies are aging by the second, and they don't work as good as they used to when you were younger. The wonderful promise for believers is that in Philippians 3.21, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And to that, all I can say, even so, come, Lord Jesus.